Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brett McKinn, and I'm a second year physics major here at UCSB. This summer, I've been working with my mentor and PI, uh, PI Dr. Lyle Washburn, in the Marine Science Institute. And today, I'm going to talk about how winds and sea level differences control coastal ocean currents. So, the coast of California is characterized by an upwelling circulation pattern, as shown in the diagram, where Equatorward winds, winds that are going to the equator, drive surface waters to move off the coast, and this brings cold, nutrient-rich, deep water up to the surface. It's this process that leads to the productive ecosystems we see along our coast, and it's all driven by the wind and the rotation of our Earth. So the region I'm studying is centered at Point Conception, a major biogeographic boundary. Uh, points in red are oceanographic moorings, which collect data on the ocean, and points in white are just locations. Uh, so, to the north, along the central California coast, upwelling occurs, but stops at Point Conception because the abrupt change in coastline is no longer conducive to the process. This means that waters in the Santa Barbara Channel are much warmer and contain more tropical species than the cooler uh, upwelled waters to the north. This means that a large range of species settled at point conception, such as uh, the giant kelp forest pictured in the background. Ecologists working in this area need to have an understanding of the diverse flow phenomenon which occur uh, because of their ability to bring in larvae, nutrients, or even pollutants from surrounding areas. So we want to get an idea of what the currents normally look like in this area, and they're all driven by the wind. Um, so, first I'll note that we have these strong equatorward winds blowing for most of the year. But during the summer, we see that the winds die down over a period of about a couple days, and this process repeats about every two weeks, where the winds relax and disappear for a few days. And when this happens, we see the shift from when the winds are normally blowing, we see predominantly equatorward currents, to when there's no wind, a complete reversal of the currents in the area, where they originate in the Santa Barbara Channel and move poleward, poleward around Point Conception. And it's not intuitive why this occurs at first glance. Um, so looking at these poleward flow events, we want to know how do we even know these events are occurring. Uh, we want to know what physical processes drive them. And along the way, we'll take a look at the physical characteristics of these flows such as the temperature and velocity, and relate it to the structure of these flows to figure out what they look like. So first we'll focus on how these flows are set up. Um, when the wind is blowing strongly, we see a region of high uh, a sea level difference develop, where a region of high sea level develops in the Santa Barbara Channel, where the H is, and a region of so low sea level develop um, north of Point Conception, where the L is. Now, let's take a look at this a little bit further. Here are two graphs superimposed each other on each other and plotted against time. In blue is the wind stress, which is a measure of how much force the wind puts on the ocean um, per square meter, where positive values indicate poleward winds and negative values correspond with equatorward winds. In green is a graph of the sea level difference between Alegria and South. Alegria is located in the Santa Barbara Channel and is higher than Sal, which is located in the north. So a positive sea level difference means that Alegria is higher than Sal. So we see that these two graphs are anti-correlated with each other. And when there's a big uh, wind stress, we see a big sea level difference. And this relationship is shown by these red arrows. But when the wind relaxes, we see in the circled areas when the wind drops to zero, we see the sea level difference, in fact, even reverse. And um, these sea level differences are on the order of one to two centimeters. So let's build a physical picture for what's going on here. Um, the equatorward wind stress causes waters to pile up uh, in the Santa Barbara Channel. And it's this piling up of waters which creates the difference in sea level. So this region of high sea level develops in the Santa Barbara Channel. But when the winds relax and disappear, there's nothing left to maintain the sea level difference. And thus, uh, it'll attempt to 
go back to equilibrium where the two heights are the same. And this is what drives these forward flows. So to get measurements on these forward flows, we, took, uh, we used what's called oceanographic moorings. And first thing I'll point out about these uh, is the acoustic Doppler current profiler, or ADCP, which is located on the sea floor. ADCPs can measure both pressure and uh, velocity. And it can measure velocity at different depths in the water column, uh, as well as the thermistor, which is located on the mooring line. Um, and these can be used to obtain a temperature profile uh, of the water column as well. By knowing the pressure, we can calculate pressure gradients, or how the pressure is changing from point to point, and thus calculate the sea level difference between those points. By knowing the velocity, we can, uh, at different places and different times, we can calculate the acceleration of these currents. And by knowing the temperature, we can calculate the density of the currents that we're seeing. Uh, so now we want to try to identify uh, a useful marker for identifying these forward flows. And since these processes are driven by the wind, it's useful to take a look at the wind stress, as this is what's really driving uh, the circulation. So here's a graph of the wind stress. Uh, in an example on uh, June 2012, it's a 10 day period. These two graphs, um, the magenta and cyan lines, simply represent two different locations the wind stress is being measured. So the, we see that the winds are strongly equatorward, but we're just going to focus on the time when the wind relaxation occurs, around June 10th, where the solid black vertical line is. Now, we know that there's a wind relaxation taking place. We'll take a corresponding uh, graph during the same time and take a look at what the temperature of the water is doing. Now, the red line represents near surface temperatures, and the blue line represents near bottom temperatures. Uh, so we can see that there is a temperature spike on June 11th at all depths. And you may wonder why there is a, about a day long delay between the wind relaxation and the arrival of the event at the Parisa Memorial, which is north of Point Conception. And it's important to remember that these events originate in the Santa Barbara Channel and take about a day to travel up around the coastline. So we see that um, the temperature spikes by 4 degrees Celsius in just a couple hours. And this is a change that you can feel if you were in the water at that time. Uh, and we, an important thing to notice about this graph is that both the bottom and the top temperatures of the water column are increasing at the same time, at nearly the same time, which suggests a vertical front associated with these flows. If we take a look at the alongshore velocity, so velocities parallel to shore, um, we can see that there is also a, a, um, a longshore spike in velocity at the same time. And this spike lasts for about a day. The length of this uh, spike tells us how uh, long these flows are, how long these currents are. And it turns out these um, currents are about 17 kilometers in the head region. And I'll talk more about that later. Um, it's also, you also note that the surface velocity is much greater than the uh, sea floor velocity. And that's probably due to the interaction with the sea floor, which involves uh, friction to slow down the, um, the water there. And now we'll take a look at the cross-shore velocities, where positive values correspond with towards the shore, and negative values correspond with offshore. And we see this classic upwelling circulation pattern once again, where um, surface waters are moving away from shore, and water depth is moving towards shore. But after the event arrives, there's a complete reversal of the circulation, where we now see surface waters moving towards the shore, and water depth moving away from shore. So now, uh, another way we wanted to, another uh, measure we wanted to see uh, physical characteristics was if there is a sea level change associated with the arrival of these flows. Uh, this is a graph of the local sea level change at the Parisma mooring, the variations with respect to the average sea level, and we concluded that there was no significant change uh, of the sea level during an event um, where the dashed vertical line is. But this may not be the case farther offshore. Uh, that'll be the subject of future investigation. Uh, so using these physical characteristics of the flow, we can now build a picture for what these currents look like. And so here is an aerial view of what these uh, currents look like. 
And we can see that we can divide this into two main regions, where we have a head region and a tail region. First, in the head region, this is what produces the spikes in a longshore velocity of about 0.4 meters per second we saw earlier. And it's, uh, uh, it's with this that we have the uh, longshore scale of. Now, um, surface currents moving onshore is represented by the curved black arrow, and water moving away from shore is represented by the dashed arrow. Uh, and now, looking at the tail region, we can further split this up into two areas, uh, where uh, closer to shore, the velocity uh, after the head of the current arrives is actually zero. But farther offshore, that's the region that supplies water to the head of the current. Uh, and measurements uh, of Q, which is the volume transport of water, uh, is obtained by uh, high frequency radar systems. And it's these systems that tell us that our, the width of these currents is about 10 to 20 kilometers. It's not too well defined. Uh, and looking at the uh, uh, cross section of these currents now, we can see ahead of the current up here is the cold upwell waters with surface waters moving offshore and water depth moving onshore and how it's completely reversed in this case after the current has arrived. So these pictures are important uh, because they give a visual representation of the, along, of the um, spatial and temporal scales of these currents. And this will help us understand their role in uh, larval delivery across uh, biogeographic boundaries. Um, so in the future, studies will focus on the dynamics farther offshore where, um, as you can see, we're not too sure, not too sure of what the outer regions look like. Uh, it's not as clearly defined. And to our right, we see pictures of mussels at Lompoc Landing, which is north of Point Conception. These have already shown to be impacted by poleward currents. And future investigations will look at the changes in larval delivery, pH, and dissolved oxygen content levels associated with these flows. And with that, I'd like to thank the NSF the SBC, LTR, and CSEP's Eureka program funding, funding me this summer, as well as uh, my mentor, Doug Washburn, Chris Gottschalk, and Carter Ullman for their guidance. Uh, so thank you. Uh, any questions? <laughs> Yeah. In one of your graphs, when you were saying, the, I think it was the temperature one, how you're saying that when the surface and bottom rise at the same time, it means it's a vertical pack? Yeah. If they're not rising at the same time, what does that mean about the structure? It means, so if you look at this diagram here, you can see that it's curved slightly, but it's basically mostly uh, vertical. If we saw a big uh, gap between the top rising first and the bottom rising well afterwards, we would have expected a much more slanted front. So this line would have been much more slanted. That's what I meant. Yeah. Yes? So I noticed why the data was from 2012. Is there uh, recent data? Yes. This was just a uh, particularly strong event that occurred in 2012. We have more recent uh, data has been taken continuously since uh, 2000. And in fact, when looking at um, more general characteristics of these flows, we tend to create ensemble averages, averages of these. So we look at multiple different events. This is just one specific example. Um, but these happen, like I said, about every two weeks during the summer. And uh, this is just a particularly strong example. Just yes. follow up on that question. What was happening like atmospheric wise that allowed for the 2012 June month to be so much more relaxed than typical winds? Um, I'm not sure too much about what makes an event particularly strong, but these uh, wind relaxations have been associated very recently with uh, larger scale atmospheric variations, and I don't know too much about that. But um, we do take a look at what the um, atmospheric pressure variations are during an event. Um, but I'm not sure. Sure about the magazine. Thank you. Should we have time for one more question? What kinds of fluctuations or uh, errors in measurement do you have? Uh, we see, so we, I got the pressure measurements uh, at one point, and those show really big variations due to tides. Uh, the variations at sea level we were trying to detect were about 10 centimeters. But the variations in tides cause about uh, variations the size of this room 
And it's very, it's periodic motion, so we can um, subtract that data out with a harmonic bit of the data. But uh, that's usually the biggest variable that we have to account for. Thank you.